Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Yeah? Amen. Hey, a couple things before we get started. Um, there are Bibles over there. If you need one, don't be afraid to grab one. And if you need one in the office or in the car, that's what they're there for. Don't be afraid to take one of those Bibles. And then here's the other thing. The quickest and easiest way to connect with the church, if you have a question, if you have a prayer request, if there's anything going on you need us to know about, there's two fast ways. One is on the back side of the bulletin at the bottom, there's a place for prayer requests or notes or anything. You can put that in the offering bag or in the offering and information card boxes on the way out the door. Okay, so turn in that card. That's the fastest way. But you can also text the church, info at cometocrossroads.org. It's on, that's also on the bulletin, that address. You can text to that email address, and uh, you can do that even during the service. If you have a question about the, the scripture we're using or about the sermon or about anything, you can text us, and that is another really fast way to connect with us. So if there's anything you need, don't be afraid to utilize either one of those two methods. Now, normally, I open with a scripture, but I'm not doing that today. Here's why. Because I want to pray a blessing over moms. Okay? Amen. So, we literally, listen, we would not be here without mothers. Literally. Right? Amen. And most of us, and I say this, I say this when I do baby dedications, most of us learn a lot about how to care and how to love most of that from our moms. And so it's a big deal and they're super important and we need to love on them and we need to appreciate them. And so if you're a mom, raise your hand, okay? All right, now, no, 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 keep them up. Moms, you don't pray. Everyone else, no, you have moms too, so you can pray. Everyone else, let's pray for moms, okay? Lord, I just thank you. I thank you, I know that I have a fabulous mother. And Lord, I know that my wife has been a wonderful mother to my children. And Lord, I just see how important moms are. And Lord, we want to bless them today. Father, I want them to know how important they are in your kingdom and in the purposes that you have for us. And Lord, sometimes I think when our kids grow up, we think that moms aren't as important, but I think they're even more important, that we show them how much we love them. And we show them that, like Jesus, we're going to stay the course loving them, even through their mess-ups. And Lord, I just pray that we, as, as uh, people who love you, can bless moms today, can show them your love, can tell them how much we appreciate them. The words that come out of our mouth, Lord, might be of more value than anything we buy them. Just help us to tell them we love them. And Lord, we give you all the glory for who you are. Bless this time today for your sake and because we love our moms. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Would you stand with us as we worship God? See him now, the King of heaven, Son of God, enthroned above.
defeated. We don't have to head our ha hang our heads in shame anymore. We don't have to fear death itself. We don't have to stand in defeat because we have found victory because of Jesus Christ. Now let's get our feet and our hands moving. Lift your head, weary sinner, the river's just ahead. Down the path of forgiveness, salvation's waiting there. You built a mighty fortress, 10,000 burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, here to lift you high.
like a prodigal child. See the walls are crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. If you're lost and left to get, don't stumble in like a prodigal child. See the walls are crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. Let the gates of glory.
love you this morning. We lay our hearts down in worship to you, Lord, and we are so thankful that each person in this room, you left the 99 to chase after the one. It's all for your glory, Lord. We love you. We thank you. And it's in your name that we pray. I know some people don't like this song because they don't like to think of God's love as reckless. But let me tell you something about God. With no guarantee that we would follow him, he died. While we were yet sinners, he was willing to give himself up to make us right. Folks, that's the kind of love that isn't the same as our love. It's the kind of love that changes the world. And and it could be called reckless because there was no guarantee how many people, God wants everyone to come to know him, but there's people who will not follow him, yet he loved them anyway, and he died for them anyway, and he died for you. And that's the amount of love and the type of love that God showers us with. And so if there's something you need to pray about or there's something you need to thank him for, remember who it is you're praying to, the God who was willing to give everything up with no guarantee that we would love him back. That's how much he loves you. The altar's open. There's people here to pray for you. If that's what you need, it's time to pray.
you leave the 99 to find the one every time. Lord, I know all of us in this room were the one at one time or another. You sought each and every one of us, Lord. And I thank you for that. And I pray that we realize, pray we never, ever lose sight, Lord, of how much you love us. I know that this world can press in on us and it seems difficult sometimes to remember that. But Lord, you have got a plan for each and every person in this room. And every single person here was beautifully and wonderfully made in your image. And even though we sin and even though we mess up, Lord, you died to bring us back. So Father, we thank you for your love. I guess my biggest prayer today, Lord, is that we might just soak it up and live in it. That it would define who we are and how we live, Lord. That we could shine your light into this world by the way we love the people around us, the way we take up our cross and follow you and sacrifice for others and give ourselves to this world, Lord, because we know that we've got your love to fall back on. We know that no matter what presses in on us or or pushes against us or comes against us, Lord, that 
If we come in the name of Jesus, if we're serving and loving in the name of Jesus, if we've got your purposes and your plans on our minds, Lord, then we can't fail. So, Lord, help us to take heart in that. But most of all, help us to fix our eyes on the one who loves us, the one who died for us, the one who chases after the one, each one of us. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 9 today. Nehemiah chapter 9. Now, before we dig into chapter 9, there's a couple things that I, I want to uh, mention. First of all, I want you to pray uh, for Terry Blake. Terry's one of our elders, and he is leaving today for China. And uh, so he's going to China. They're going to do some uh, ministry over there. He's, got some, he's been asked to do some teaching, and so it's, it's cool. So um, pray for him, and um, just pray for him. It's a long trip, and, and uh, it's a good thing that we get to, to send people out to do these things. So uh, Elder Terry, who's over our missions, is leaving today, so pray for him. The other thing is, uh, you know, as the church has gotten bigger, we have three services, and we don't always know what goes on in other services, but I want to let you know that we've had, uh, we had four baptisms this weekend. So praise the Lord. We had three on Saturday and one first service, and it was really cool because uh, first service, the dad actually baptized his son, and, and that's a good thing, and dad's very involved. He's a small group leader, but we want, uh, we want dads to do that and moms to do that because it's important that children see their parents as their spiritual leaders. So anyway, that's a good thing, and we should celebrate that, and, and I think sometimes that when we get you know three, three separate services, we almost can get in the mindset of three separate churches, but there's just one church. It's just the kingdom, man. We're all in this together, and so I want to share those things with you so that you can be praying for Terry and you can celebrate those baptisms. So... We're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 9. Now, uh, we have been working through the book of Nehemiah. I will let you know that we only have about four weeks left in Nehemiah. Next week, uh, this prayer we're talking about today actually continues into next week a little bit, and we'll, we'll be covering that, chapter 10, and then we're going to spend three weeks talking about worship. Nehemiah chapter 12, they have a huge worship service, and we're going to use that as a foundation for three weeks discussing uh, why we do what we do and how we do what we do and who we should be worshiping and what that looks like, and not only Sunday worship, but a lifestyle of worship. So uh, be ready for, for that, and then we'll be done with Nehemiah. But as we get into chapter 9 of Nehemiah, Last week in chapter 8, we saw that the joy of the Lord was their strength. And remember, the people were, were crying and weeping, and Nehemiah told them, no, 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 no. There's a time to cry and weep, but this isn't it. This is a time to celebrate. And we discussed that there are seasons in our spiritual journey. And if we, if we look at the book of Nehemiah, we see that in the beginning of Nehemiah, he was weeping and, and crying and fasting and wanting God to speak and listening to God. And then God gave him this plan. And, and if you remember in chapter 2, he went out and he, he listened to God and kind of saw what God had planned. And then he enacted that plan. He was opposed. There was a, a season of opposition. And then they had some success and he was dragging people in. And, and then they, they celebrated. So all of these different things were going on, and in each season, God had this different plan. One was a season of, of uh, connecting with God, and there was lots of weeping that went on there. But then last week, it was a season of, of celebration. And in that time, God used that to build them up. And so at each step along the way, there were, there were different things going on kind of in their, in their spiritual journey. Well, if that's true, it is, you would expect then if this is our seasons and this is a cycle, that sooner or later we've got to come back to a time of reconnecting with God and hearing from God, a season similar to what Nehemiah chapter 1 was. Well, we have that in chapter 9, but here's what's so cool about it. It's everybody. Let's start, let's, let's read the first few verses and we'll dig in and I'll show you what I mean. On the 24th day of the same month, so he's referring to chapter 8, when they were in the seventh month. On the 24th day of that month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and weep, uh, wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood where they were and read from the book of the law, their God, for a quarter of the day. 
and spend another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. Standing on the stairs of the Levites were Jeshua, Benai, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Benai, Sherebiah, Benai, and Kenani. They cried out with loud voices to the Lord their God. Okay? So, we have now come full circle, and we've entered back into another season of, of repenting and wanting to hear from God. Now, there was some of that last week. There was conviction, but they, they said, no, 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 we're celebrating. There'll be a time for that. Well, a few weeks later, two and a half weeks later or so, here they are again. And it is now time to repent, and it says they put on sackcloth and ashes, okay? And it's amazing because remember Nehemiah chapter 1, it was just him. Nehemiah chapter 1, his heart was broken by the state of affairs of his people in Jerusalem, and, and he, he wept aloud, and he fasted, and he cried, and he wanted to hear from God. God, what do I do about this? Now, it's all the people. Now, folks, I, I don't want you to miss this. This cycle has come full circle, and, and just think what would happen if each and every one of us did this. In my mind, I was thinking just, just of dads, just if, if fathers, if fathers would have this moment with God and they would cry out to God and they would go through this cycle where God then showed them what their, what their purpose and their passion was and they dealt with the opposition and they grew and they celebrated. When that comes back around, now it's mom, dad, and kids. And if everyone in the house does that, when that cycle comes back around, it could be a week, it could be a year, but when that cycle comes back around, now it's friends and neighbors and classrooms and workplaces. That's the kind of growth that God has planned for the kingdom. See, we deal in addition. Let's invite someone to church. God deals in multiplication. And, and the, the potential for the kingdom is amazing if, if we will let this happen to us. And so we've gone in chapter one from one man to chapter nine, all the people. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's beautiful. Now, there's a couple things I want you to notice in that. The first one is, it says they separated themselves. This is important, and this has to do with the season. Because remember, last week in the season of celebration, they weren't separating themselves. In fact, they were going out and seeking people to share with. But this week, and Nehemiah did the same thing in chapter one, he kind of got off by himself. It says he was all by himself and prayed and fasted for days. Okay, we need to make sure that we get separated, but at the right time, in the right season. You see, the church, I think the church has a problem in that they have separated at the wrong time. We separate during the season of growth or during the season of celebration. We, we get our holy huddle together and we say, yay, look what God's done for me. We're not supposed to separate when we celebrate. We're supposed to separate when we connect. We're supposed to separate for the sake of focusing on God. And then, after God has, has worked on us, and after we have grown, and after we have heard his voice, and after we have repented, then we reconnect with people. We get it backwards. Sometimes today, we separate when we should be sharing we have to make sure we don't fall into that. So they, they get this separation right. It's a holy separation, okay? Not an unholy separation. By the way, the word separate means sanctified. That's, that's what the word sanctified means, to be set apart. And we are set apart from the world in that we don't live or act like them. But an actual physical separation from them shouldn't take place all the time. It should only take place when you and God, you know, think about the life of Jesus. He went off by himself to lonely places and prayed. But that didn't define his whole ministry. Most of his ministry was out with the people, eating with publicans and sinners, and then every once in a while, he would go, go away. See this pattern that's developing? That's what's being described here. The other thing I love about this is they stood where they were and read from the book of the law for a quarter of a day. By the way, that's three hours. I wish it was six, but they marked day by 12 hours, 12 hours day, 12 hours night, Okay. So a quarter of the day, they, they read from the Bible, and then another quarter of the day, they worshiped. Look at the growth. Nehemiah won. He was the only one. He was by himself. God's people, they were in this predicament because they hadn't been doing what they were called to do, and he was doing it. Now, 52 days later, plus 
a month. So 82 days later, three months. Now the whole group is doing it. This is so beautiful. Three hours of, of the word and three hours of worship. That would be fun, wouldn't it? Don't tempt me. Okay? It, it, but, but look, and, and you know, we joke about it, but, but look at what was going on. The people are so hungry. These are the same people that three months ago didn't know anything about this. This is a beautiful picture of what happens. Again, if we will stay focused, if we will stay focused. And then finally, and I love verse four. Verse four, it's easy to miss verse four and think that it's not that important. Remember last week, we talked about the fact that we are all priests, okay? Last week, we looked at Second Peter where it says that, or First Peter, I can't remember, but in one of the books of Peter, he says that the priesthood of all believers, maybe it's First Peter chapter two, the priesthood of all believers is what the New Testament teaches, okay? Well, in the Old Testament, there was a family of just priests, but those priests, those priests were doing what they were supposed to do. They hadn't been. For hundreds of years, they had not been doing what they were supposed to be doing, but now they were. And in verse four, it says that they were interceding. They were crying out with loud voices to the Lord their God, and, and they were doing that for the people. We see that in the next section. They were doing that for the people. Folks, that's our job. If there's gonna be revival, and there's gonna be sustained revival, revival that grows exponentially, Okay? We, we as the priests need to be praying. We need to be praying for the lost. We need to be praying for each other. We need to be interceding for the people around us. That's our job as priests. The Levites hadn't been doing it. When they start doing it, look what's going on. It's, it's an amazing thing. Now, the next several verses, like verse 5 through verse 31, is a long prayer of intercession that the Levites prayed for Israel. We're going to take a few minutes and we're going to hear that. And the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Benai, Hashabniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, stand up and praise the Lord your God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, and the seas and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, and you made a covenant with him to give his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his officials and all the people of his land, for you knew how arrogantly the Egyptians treated them. You made a name for yourself, which remains to this day. You divided the sea before them so that they passed through it on dry ground. But you hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into mighty waters. By day, you led them with a pillar of cloud and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the way where they were going. You came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them regulations and laws that are just and right and decrees and commands that are good. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and gave them commands, decrees, and laws through your servant Moses. In their hunger, you gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst, you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. But they, our ancestors, became arrogant and stiff-necked. They did not obey your commands. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and in their rebellion appointed a leader in order to return to their slavery. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them, even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf and said, this is our God who brought you up out of Egypt, or when they committed awful blasphemies. Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. By day, the pillar of cloud did not fail to guide them on their path. 
nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. For 40 years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen. You gave them kingdoms and nations, allotting to them even the remotest frontiers. They took over the country of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the country of Ah, king of Bashan. You made their children as numerous as the stars in the sky, and you brought them into the land that you told their parents to enter and possess. Their children went in and took possession of the land. You subdued before them the Canaanites who lived in the land. You gave the Canaanites into their hands along with their kings and the peoples of their land to deal with them as they pleased. They captured fortified cities and fertile land. They took possession of houses filled with all kinds of good things, wells already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. They ate to the full and were well nourished. They reveled in your great goodness. But they were disobedient and rebelled against you. They turned their backs on your law. They killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. They committed awful blasphemies. So you delivered them into the hands of their enemies who oppressed them. But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. And from heaven, you heard them. And in your great compassion, you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hand of their enemies. But as soon as they were at rest, they again did what was evil in your sight. Then you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they ruled over them. And when they cried out to you again, you heard from heaven and in your compassion, you delivered them time after time. You warned them in order to turn them back to your law, but they became arrogant and disobeyed your commands. They sinned against your ordinances of which you said, the person who obeys them will live by them. Stubbornly, they turned their backs on you, became stiff necked and refused to listen. For many years you were patient with them. By your spirit you warned them through your prophets, yet they paid no attention. So you gave them into the hands of the neighboring peoples. But in your great mercy you did not put an end to them or abandon them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. So, that's a long prayer. And here's my question. I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, but I want you to see something about that prayer, okay? He prayed for five minutes, at least that's how long it took me to read it, and basically he said two things. God is good. We are not. Why couldn't he just say that once and move on, right? Because he said... God is good because he created. God is good because he calls us and equips us. God is good because he powerfully saves. God is good because he saves us in person. God is good because he's compassionate and sustains us and because he provides us opportunities. He said, we are stiff-necked and rebellious. We refuse to listen. We're stiff-necked. We're stiff-necked. We're stiff-necked. We're stiff-necked. Get that? Stiff-necked means we do what we want, not what he wants. We take him for granted. We blaspheme him. We're arrogant. We're disobedient. Why couldn't he just say it one time? Why do he keep saying it, saying it, saying it, saying it? Folks, I think there's something we need to learn there. There's something really important about that prayer that that goes on and on. The first thing is, hearing things out loud is different. One of the reasons that we confess our sins is because hearing things out of our mouth and verbally into our ears reinforces them. And we need to know that we're sinners, and we need to know that God is good. We need to keep that in line. He's up here and we're down here. And without him, we're in big trouble. And so just saying that he is good reminds us of just how good he is. We can think about it, but when it comes out of our mouth and goes in our ears, it is powerful. And the same goes for our own sin. The same go- I think sometimes we, we underplay our sin. We think repentance means to say, I'm sorry, God. Repentance means to move in the wrong direction, one of the, in the other direction, in the right direction. Stop moving in the wrong direction, move in the right direction. Why do, we, why do we think that it means only to say, I'm sorry? I think sometimes because we don't actually speak our sins out loud. We don't confess our sins out loud and realize how bad they are. Now, we can confess them each to another, it says in James that we should do that. But I'm talking about even with God, praying out loud, speaking. Okay? 
It, it reinforces those things. The other thing is, I think God wants to know. When we pray about our sin, I think God wants to know that we know. And you can think about it and say, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. Or, wouldn't say anything. Get it? Okay. But, but I think when we speak them, that's how humility grows. When that gets reinforced, then God knows that you know. You're taking it serious. Okay? And then, but the last thing I think is the most important. I think there's something important, not only about speaking them because it reinforces them, but it says in John chapter 3 that, that uh, there's this battle going on between light and darkness, and, and God is light, and men like the darkness because their deeds are dark. And when we pull those out and we set them in the light, they lose their power over us. And I know that it's symbolic because I'm not saying that everyone should come up here and confess their sins to the whole world. I'm saying between you and God, when you actually speak them out loud, it puts them in a place where God's light shines on them and they wither and die, okay? When we keep them in here, we think we've confessed them, but, but there's just a little bit we've held back. And maybe it's symbolic, maybe it's not, but we want to get them out into the light so that God can deal with them. Okay, so, so even though this prayer was long, it's important, and we need to learn from it, that we need to, to verbalize the good things about God in our lives and the bad things about us in our lives if we're going to turn those things around. Now, it's the end of this prayer that I wanted to spend the most time on, although it, it, it isn't very long. So we won't be there too long. But let me read the end of this prayer. And there's a couple things I want to talk about. It says in verse 32, Now, therefore, that's a double whammy. Now, therefore, now, therefore, our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who helps, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. The hardship that has come on us, on our kings and leaders, on our priests and prophets, on our ancestors and all your people, from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. Our kings, our leaders, our priests, and our ancestors did not follow your law. They did not pay attention to your commands or the statutes you warned them to keep. Even while they were in their kingdom, enjoying your great goodness to them in the spacious and fertile land you gave them, they did not serve you or turn from their evil ways. But see, we are slaves today, slaves in the land you gave our ancestors so they could eat its fruit and the other good things it produces. Because of our sins, its abundant harvest goes to the kings you've placed over us. They rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. Now, I do want to mention right here that, that this is a strange place to end. And we're going to end here today, but this prayer continues next week. And what they do is they make a promise to God based on the conviction that, that they've brought upon themselves through this prayer. Okay? But there's a couple things in this prayer that I want to make sure we see. The first thing is the word trifling. I love that word. Do not let all of this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. That's a strange choice of wording. And the Hebrew word there is ma'at, and it literally means to dwindle. Don't let us dwindle in your sight is what it literally says. What I think it means is, Lord, please take us seriously. Okay, and the Hebrew means, Lord, please take us seriously. And folks, I'll tell you why I think that's important. Because I don't think we take him very seriously. I think there's a lot of times that we, we talk about God, and we go through the motions, and we want to make sure that, that, you know, that our church has a roof and that we have a place to show up. But when we walk out of here, are we really living for God? It's a hard question. And I think it's a question that would, would, would trip up a lot of believers. A lot of people who say, I'm, I'm all in for Jesus. I'm not sure they really are day to day to day to day. And that's a tough thing. And so this, this, this prayer is important because you can't ask God to take you seriously. Basically, it's like saying, Lord, I'm ready to take you seriously. That's what he says. He says, please, Lord, take us seriously because I'm going to now. I'm going to take you seriously now. So, so there's a, a beautiful hint there about what we need to do 
If we're going to see this revival, again, this whole chapter is about what Nehemiah did, multiplying. And if it's going to multiply, each and every one of us as God's people has got to take him seriously. And that's the intercessory prayer that this priest prays for the people. Okay, but here's, I think, the most important verse in this section, verse 33. He says, in all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. Now, folks, a lot had happened to them. They'd lost their kingdom. They'd lost their homes. They would basically lost everything they had. And he prays. Now, he also prays we deserved everything we got. But do you think that every single Jew was guilty of not following God? I know they weren't because I know Daniel and his three friends were still following God even while they were were in Babylon, okay? So the good Jews got carried away with the bad Jews. The prophets who were seeking after God, they got carried away with all the people who wouldn't obey. He says, God, while all this bad stuff was happening, you were still righteous. Folks, it is really, really important that you hear this point. We do not judge God's goodness based on what he does for us or what happens in our lives. God is good no matter what happens. Okay? That, now, I know we get that, but really do we get that? Because there's a lot of people, both marginal in the church, people say, well, I don't believe in God because this bad thing happened. That's very common. You all know someone who thinks that. I'm not going to church because, because look at all the crime. Why would God let that happen? I don't have the answer to all those questions. But what I know is God's still good. There's also a big, a big movement in the church to say that God shows himself through, through only through miracles. Signs and wonders. I believe in signs and wonders. God really does show up and heal people. And he really does not show up and not heal people. When he decides not to heal, he's still good. That's what we've got to grab onto. You know why? Because in all the words about growth and abundance and God's blessing, there's also words like he takes away. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. When he takes away, he's still good. It says the Lord prunes. When he prunes and puts difficult things in your life, he's still good. If we don't know this, If we don't live right here, we've got half the gospel. And you are set, pride comes before the fall. What we've done then is make the gospel about us. It's about my understanding, it's about my needs being met, and not mine, maybe that person's or that person's. I'm not asking for a miracle, I just want one for him. But it doesn't, it's not about us, it's all about him. And we don't have the whole picture. So we've gotta grab onto this. And we've got to understand that even when the world is falling apart, God is still good. And, and this is what the Jews have grabbed onto. They've realized, hey, we created this whole mess. And God's good no matter what. And he's got a plan. We don't know what it is. Basically, that's where he ends. We don't know. We are in great distress. He He ends, well, this ends. There's another another line in in this prayer that that we're going to handle next week. But here he says, basically, look, this is a mess. And I don't know what to do with it, Lord. But I know you're good. Okay? This is really, really important. Because what this tells us, what this means to us, is that we, we need to stay focused on God. When, when this doesn't make sense, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. When he blesses, when he's miraculous, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. Not on the miracle, on Jesus. When he's not, I'm not going to focus on the problem. I'm going to focus on Jesus. Because it's all about him. And all of the signs and wonders and all of the bad things put together don't mean a hill of beans. Jesus. Okay? The only proof we need, guess what? No matter what happens in this world... No matter what happens to you and I, no matter what happens to our families, no matter how many uh, people die or no matter how many people live or no matter how much blessing or cursing we have in this world, Jesus still died on a cross for you and he still walked out of an empty tomb and that's all the proof we need. Okay? So this is where we have to focus. We keep our eyes on Jesus through everything. This is what got them 
out of trouble. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This group, we said this last week, we're going to say it this week, and I'm sure it'll come up next week. This group had no idea what was coming. They didn't know the name of Jesus. This is the Old Testament. But they knew God was going to do something because they were living in faith. Folks, if ever we see something that takes us from Nehemiah, one man, having a revival, to Nehemiah 9, with a whole group of people having a revival, it's this, God's people living in faith. If we do that, if we will watch him and follow him through thick and thin, and that means confessing, and that means celebrating, and that means all the things these Levites have done today, interceding, and if we'll do that, all focused on Jesus, he will allow us literally to change our world. He'll use us for that. Let's pray. Lord. I thank you. I thank you for this prayer. I thank you for Levites who were called back into your purpose. Father, I thank you that they weren't allowing their circumstance or allowing any of the hardships or blessings that went on around them to turn their focus from you. They realized, Lord, that you were the only way. And they realized their mistakes and they, they looked forward to a future now that was gonna be committed to you. And Lord, I know that as we read on, we can see places where they failed. Well, Lord, I pray that you would remind us that we need to have that same focus. That if we're going to have this exponential revival in our lives, we need to keep our eyes fixed on you. We need to live in faith, Lord, that you're going to take care of things. And Father, as we do that, and as we, we live for you, and we, we intercede, and we pray, and we celebrate, and we go through all these seasons that we've seen in the book of Nehemiah, Lord, I pray that we would always Keep Jesus on the throne, knowing that he is the way and the truth and the life. We praise you, we thank you, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take communion in a minute. And, and uh, I thought earlier, I thought of an interesting communion meditation, and I'll share it. I want to mention the, the bulletins first. Folks, on the bulletin, there's a couple of things. It says, have you promised your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior? Maybe you're sitting here and you're not a Christian. You have to take that step. You have to say, hey, I need some information. This might be for real, okay? You gotta put that in the offering bag or in the box later. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you know that Jesus is real. You know that God is truth, but you just don't know how to move forward. There's a box for that too. Folks, if you don't take the first step, we can't help you, okay? God has done what he's supposed to do. He died on a cross for you. Now he waits for us to respond. If you need help, let us know. That's what those cards are for. Okay. Now, here's the thing I thought earlier about communion. You know what? We remember Jesus' death at communion, and we do that every week. And, and we always, sometimes we apply it to different things going on. But think what would have happened if Jesus would have let the circumstances surrounding communion, surrounding his death, deter him from doing what God had planned for him. Because the night of his, the, the, the night before his death, Thursday night, Peter said, I'll never leave you, and denied him three times. Judas betrayed him to the, to the Pharisees, and when he got arrested, the other 11 guys, off they went, scattered. If I was Jesus, I think I probably would have said, never mind, I'm not dying for you, yahoos. Yeah, think about it. I mean, it's incredible what he had to go through. And he did it for you. So sometimes we, we look at our lives and we think, well, this, I just don't know if this is what God had planned for me. Trust me, it is. And if it's not, he'll fix it, but you gotta let him. Okay? But don't let your circumstances, don't let your circumstances, good or bad, paint a picture of who God is. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, whether you're having a good day or a bad. In the face of death or when he's performing miracles, he's the same. Don't forget that. Jesus taught us that at the cross. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you were willing to sacrifice. Father, I can't even imagine how difficult it must have been. But Lord, it was a backwards picture it doesn't make sense at the time. 
But now looking back, Lord, it makes perfect sense. It's the way you show your love. Help us to know, Lord, that you're good. Help us to live in it, celebrate it. Keep our eyes fixed on you no matter what, Lord. Because you did die on a cross and you did walk out of a tomb. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. My name is Eric Swecker, and I am a follower of Jesus Christ, husband of Jody, father of Erica, Joel, Caleb, and then now Nate, and pops to Noel. I'm also on the board at the AIM Women's Center, and I wanted this day, this Mother's Day, I wanted to share uh, a few highlights from, from the AIM Women's Center. Of course, we meet regularly as part of the board, and I wanted to kind of give you, um, as, as a church, as a corporate church, you help sponsor and support the mission of the AIM Women's Center. And there are a lot of individuals here who give of themselves and give of their money also to the AIM Women's Center. Sorry. Um, so, as part of the director's report from April 15th, uh, total client visits, client visits for the month of March were 79. Total clients served, 46. Pregnancy tests given, 19. Ultrasounds accomplished, 22. 22. Material assistance given, 23. Classes delivered in motherhood and bringing up babies, 15. Choices for life in the month, Mar in the month of March, 16. So far this year, at that point, in April 15th, there were 39 choices for life. Amen. So far since... February of 2017, which is an important milestone as we change some of the methodology there, there have been 278 choices for life. And you are a very important part of that. But I want to draw your attention to the fact that in here this morning, there are 228 attendees in this room right now. 228 Open this up, add another group of chairs, and you get to the, about the number of babies that have been saved since February of 2017. And also, importantly, on this day of motherhood, 278 young women in the Ohio Valley woke up this morning without grief and pain and suffering. Instead, they woke up to life and motherhood. Let us pray. Our glorious God, we are so thankful. I'm so thankful for the glory of motherhood. Motherhood that you care so much for that on the cross, you took care of your mom. I thank you, dear God, that this church and this body and these people care about life, care about your will, desire to help the Ohio Valley in this way. I thank you. I ask that we would continue, that you would continue to bless us and you'd continue to show us the way. We give you this offering now and hope that it is a sweet fragrance for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you, brother. Let's stand up and worship God.
right, I got a lot, we got a lot going on, but bear with me. I'll try to get through it quickly. First of all, um, June 29th is our work day that we're going to go out and fix up homes in the community, bless the community. It's our Building Relationships Work Day. You will be able to sign up to participate in that over the next three weekends. So just be ready over the next three weekends in the lobby. Uh, there'll be a sign up for the Building Relationships Work Day on June 29th. Also, next Saturday, this Saturday, this coming Saturday, May 18th, we've got a couple events. There is a youth, uh, a fundraiser for the youth group for their missions trip. It's going to be a yard sale. They're going to uh, fill the front parking lot with uh, stuff, your stuff that you're bringing, hopefully at seven o'clock that morning. And then they'll price it, sell it, get it out of here, and dispose of the leftovers for you. So if there's anything you can help with, bring it. If you have questions, see uh, Roy, the youth pastor, or call the church, we'll give you details. All right, but also that same day, this coming Saturday, May 18th, from nine to noon, is a Christian singles workshop. Now this is something that we came up with because uh, and we asked someone who speaks about relationships but is also a pastor to come in and do a workshop for Christian singles because I believe that singles are one of the most overlooked people groups in the church. Whether you are a widow or widower or whether you're divorced or whether you just haven't been married yet, uh, there's a group of people that, that sometimes gets missed with programming. We're always doing family stuff, okay? but singles are a family too. And so from 9 to noon this coming Saturday... Uh, there is a singles, Christian singles workshop, very important. All right, um, the other thing, two more things. Uh, the next three months, this church is off the hook busy. And one of the ways we really serve the community is by allowing people to use this room. We have like 30 graduation parties in the next two months. So we really need help. It's a huge ministry to those families. Um, a lot of those families don't come to church here yet, yeah, that's how we get them, huh? But we need people to set up chairs. Every Saturday at 2 o'clock, there's a team of people here setting up chairs. You know, if, if 12 to 15 people show up, it takes 20 minutes. If one guy shows up, it takes him an hour and a half, or two hours, or three hours. So uh, think about that. Saturday's at 2. If you can help with that and you kind of want to be assigned to a team, because there's two different teams doing it every other week, text the church or fill out a, a bulletin or call the church, and we'll get you in connection with the team leaders. All right, last but certainly not least... Our, we, you know that we have a new first impressions ministry, uh, greeters, and we're calling them the wow team. They're in the parking lot. They're doing lots of different stuff. Um, if you want to be involved in that, you can show up for training dates. They're coming up. Are they behind me? Boom. Wednesday, Sunday, Wednesday, Sunday for the next two weeks. This Wednesday, next Sunday, this Wednesday, the Sunday after. So those are training times for our first impression ministry. We need a lot of people because we have a lot of new people coming in. And it just takes a lot of people to be over-the-top loving. Amen. Praise the Lord. So anything you have a question on about any of this, call the church or email the church or get on the church website. Whew. Happy Mother's Day, moms. Everybody else, treat your mama good today, okay? All right, let me pray. Lord, I just thank you. Thank you for this day. I thank you for the reminder, Lord, that we need to serve you with all that we have and fix our eyes on you no matter what else happens. And Father, I just praise you for, for loving us, for using us, for the plan you have for us. We thank you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.